Welcome to the beginning of the end. Get yourself ready to kill Laha Brea for the fourth time this game. He's going to put up a fight, but if you've made it this far, you're prepared for it. It's a short, but very fast fight. Set up light party groups, clock spots, and partner groups. One DPS to one non-DPS, with DPS being into cardinal spots and support being cardinal spots. Have support rotate clockwise to find who and where your partner is. Or do as my team does and have partner spots be unrelated to clocks. Tanks and ranged north, melee and healers south. There's still a bunch of role-based mechanics in this fight too, but we'll discuss all that as we continue. And my reminder from normal mode, watch the black lines. This is very useful for Sunforge and the second set of transformations. While the arena is 4x4 tiles, the black lines are a second 3x3 three three set of tiles, one mid and one on each cardinal and intercardinal. Genesis of Flame is a basic raid wide, but being the final fight, it will hurt extremely hard. And for basically everything, it will do lethal damage without shields or mitigation. Immediately, we are met with a split of mechanics. Conceptual Octa Flare or Conceptual Tetra Flare will be cast. These are delayed mechanics that are activated by a Sunforge cast. So watch the name and remember it. Conceptual Octaflare is spreads, while Conceptual Tetraflare is partner stacks. This will be comboed with Volcanic Torches and then Sunforge. This set of Volcanic Torches will always make the corners unsafe, leaving you three potential safe spots. The easiest way to determine your safe spot is to watch the walls. If the walls have blue flames, those squares are unsafe. If either wall is not blue, the middle square is unsafe, and you want to be toward that wall. Make sure you stay within your intercardinal partner spot. As soon as you see which spot is safe, move into that square. The torches will snapshot their damage the moment they complete their movement, not when they actually explode. Both you and your partner will go to the same square regardless of the pattern and prepare for a random Sunforge cast. Just like in normal, it is either a dragon or the phoenix. Dragon will do a line through the middle black squares, and the phoenix the outer black squares. Make sure the torches went off before moving. As mentioned, conceptual mechanics go off when activated by Sunforge. So as soon as torches end, move into whatever position you need to for Octaflare or Tetraflare. If it is Tetraflare, Make sure you and your partner stick together with the Sunforge dodge. Spread out for Octaflare. The worst possible pattern you can get is Conceptual Octaflare, torches that make the East or West Outer Square safe, and Phoenix. This clip here is exactly that. You have to be fast in your spread. The moment Sunforge is done, he will use Flame Viper. Flame Viper is a double tank buster that requires a double tank swap. You also can't tank in Volnit because both hits give bleeds and Volns. At best, you will invuln some of the bleed to reduce the healing needed. This is a thin line AoE at the first target and again at the second target. You must immediately swap back to the first tank and auto attack is soon to follow. Do not be afraid to kitchen sink here. There are very few of these and so using every cooldown you can will be very appreciated, especially due to the bleeds. The second one isn't for another three minutes or so, but the second and third are placed very close together. Just make sure both tanks have their stances ready and provoke back and forth properly. Reforged Reflection is another split in the timeline. We can get either Hippocampos or Gorgon like in normal. He will always alternate them, so if Hippocampos is first, he will then do Gorgon, Hippocampos, and then Gorgon, or vice versa. Regardless of whichever one it is, watch his animation, and also pop Arm's Length or sure cast if you're bad at that. Forms 1 and 2 are 2 minutes apart, so you'll get to use it at the correct time either way. Because it seems to be the ideal ordering for better openers, let's talk about Gorgon's first. When you see his arm break its chain, get out of his hitbox. He will do an AoE kick the size of his hitbox. Long as you're even one step out, you're good. Gorgon is a repeat of T6 for all you raiders from a Realm Reborn days. He will cast Gorgomantea and give two sets of buffs, roll-based. 
set 1 will be DPS, and set 2 all support, or vice versa. With everyone being given a number to denote this, two players within each set will have Eye of the Gorgon, and two with Blood of the Gorgon, Cone Icon and Snake Icon respectively. They also resolve in that order within each set of debuffs. Into the Shadows will spawn two sets of Gorgons, with a small pause between them. Each Gorgon will need an Eye and a Blood of the Gorgon to get rid of, which means pairing up one Eye with one Blood. The Gorgons will rise out of the ground and cast a Gaze Petrification. Look away when they do. Their ending positions are random, but you can get a sense of their movements and pay attention to a few tells, such as starting direction. They also always begin burrowing into Cardinally. All Gorgons will pop out Cardinally or into Cardinally, never a mix of both. So if Gorgons 1 and 2 are north and south, 3 and 4 are east and west. Then, as an Eye of the Gorgon player, turn to look at your Gorgon as your debuff runs out. You will shoot a Petrification Beam forward, freezing the Gorgon in turn. Then, the Blood of the Gorgon player will stack with the Gorgon and drop their debuff. It does AoE damage that also affects Petrified Gorgons, killing them instantly. The easiest way I've found to deal with this is to handle it similarly to Venom Puddles in P5S. Have Pair 1 prioritize Northwest and go counterclockwise, with Pair 2 going clockwise from North. However, your partner is not static. In P5S, I was paired with my Co-Melee, but we might both get Eye of the Gorgon. As a result, you need to set up some sort of priority system within your role. For consistency, you can use your Light Parties, which makes Light Party 1, Group 1, start Northwest and go counterclockwise. My Light Party co-DPS is our Dancer, so I would pair with him. However, there's the chance that we get the same debuff. If we do, me and the Ninja will swap spots. This guarantees both Gorgons are taken care of. Do the same with the Tanks and Healers. If you have the same debuff as your partner, both tanks will swap. With all that in mind, the order of events is as follows. Gorgons 1 and 2 spawn. Look away from them, a 90 degree angle works. First eyes will freeze the Gorgons. First bloods will drop their AoE on the Gorgons. Gorgons 3 and 4 will almost immediately spawn, so make sure to immediately look away. Second eyes freeze their Gorgons, second bloods kill their Gorgons. It will take a bit to get the flow down, but after you do, it becomes much easier. Heal up from the very painful blood AoEs and prepare for Ectothermos. This is still essentially just Genesis of Flame, but that means it hurts. He will then de-transform. Now let's go over the Hippocampus form. Starting off Hippocampus, if you see chains around his legs break, immediately hit arm's length and sure cast. He will land with footprint, causing a large knockback. If for some reason you cannot invone it, get knocked to the corner from as close as you can in his hitbox. You may want to move a heal in mid for a better healing spot, or both slightly in if you feel it necessary. Otherwise, everyone head to their clock spots. Rearing Rampage is four back-to-back raid-wide hits. Each slam will also cast Uplift onto completely random players, causing further damage in a targeted AoE. This is why we are spread. Every player will get an uplift. Remember your order. If you got hit by the first uplift, you will be the first players for the next and final mechanic of the Hippocampus form. He will begin to cast Stomp Dead. It's limit cut again, but pairs of players and baited based on distance. He will jump four times onto the furthest away players. The middle of his hitbox will be moved to that player with a jump causing a decent-sized stack AoE. It is smaller than his hitbox, though, so it's not as dangerous as it seems. Though it hits very hard, so in that way it meets expectations. Stay within the middle four squares. The entire out of 12 are not needed. The strat is corner to middle. Everyone stack on the edge of his hitbox and no further than that. For us, we go east, the B marker. Group 1, the players who got hit by the first uplift, will go northeast and to the max melee range. Group 2 will stand in the exact center of the arena. After the first jump, Group 1 and Group 3 will swap spots. After the second jump, Group 2 and Group 4 swap spots. After the fourth jump, he will be back mid and the transformation will end. 
If you do any strategy that does not return the boss mid, move him back there manually when the deed transformation finishes. That finishes talking about the Reforged Reflections. Let's return to the main rotation of the fight. No matter what, make sure he is mid and prepare for Illusory Creation. This is a six-part mechanic, all within a short time. The cast itself simply creates four clones, one on each cardinal. Creation on command, meanwhile, will give each clone a Sunforge mechanic. They go off two at a time, but are consistent in some ways. The first two to go off will always be a Phoenix and a Dragon. This will leave the safe black line squares to be north and south, or east and west safe. Look for either of the Sun Forge and react accordingly. If you see the dragon in front of you, run to the left or right without leaving the middle row. If you see the Phoenix, run to it or away from it. You also want to run toward your intercardinal spots and pretend you are doing Conceptual Octaflayer. Manifold Flames will be cast while dodging the first Sunforge. This has two parts. Firstly, as mentioned, spread out. All DPS or all support will be hit with Hemetheos' Flare. All players of the role who were not hit will need to move into the boss to bait four line AoEs. These Nest of Flame Vipers are based on the closest players. Try to aim these for Intercardinals, while the players who got Flares will go to the Cardinals and stand outside of his hitbox. Provided everyone who is meant to be out stays out, the four undamaged players will get a Flame Viper. Heal up for the second pair of clones. These clones will always be the same. Two Dragons or two Phoenix. Dragons will make a plus, forcing everyone out to the corners. Phoenix means everyone must stay mid. Regardless of which pattern you get, he will cast either Nesta Flame Vipers or Tetra Flare. Tetra Flare, just stack up like you would for conceptual Tetra Flare. It's just there's no delay now. Nesta Flame Vipers are the same AoEs we just dealt with from Manifold Flames, but everyone gets one. Go to your clock spots if it's a Phoenix Sunforge. If it's Dragon, it gets a bit harder. But again, just treat it like Octaflare. Your melee player will stick closer to mid, but maybe a step or two to the side for a little leeway. The ranged player will go to the wall. This gives a sharp enough angle that both players get hit without hitting each other. Immediately run mid for healing and react to the torches that spawned. Turn the camera southwest and watch closely. Only one corner square in the entire arena will be safe, determined at random by the torch movements. You want to head in the opposite direction of the torch movements. The ones on the right determine north or south. The ones to the left determine east or west. So if these make a turn to the right, toward north, you want to be towards south. And if these start heading to the left, towards east, you want to be west. That would make southwest the safe spot. It will be the easiest to notice since there will be no blue flames on the wall. So then, react to this one. If you said northeast, you can go into the mechanic relatively confidently. When you get to the safe square, prepare for Genesis Aflame, the same basic raid wide. After a moment, he will jump mid and do the next Reforged Reflection. Remember, if Gorgon was first, this will be Hippocampus. React accordingly, and you are now halfway through the fight, which means he's going to start trying to kill you. Yeah, he wasn't trying yet. Phase 2 begins with Conceptual Tetra Flare or Conceptual Octa Flare, like before. Again, this is Sunforge activated. Fourfold fires are very painful proximity AoEs at the corners of the arena. Get direct mid and get ready for Chthonic Vents. These work the same as in normal, having two random vents explode and then send dragons out to explode other vents at random. There will be a total of three explosions. The issue comes with the second explosion. Tetra Flare or Octa Flare will be cast and go off instantly. This is completely random, regardless of what the conceptual cast was. Because of the vents being random, you have to be ready to stack or spread in specific spots. The simplest way is to just again, do light parties across your Gorgon spots. Group 1, counterclockwise. Group 2, clockwise. Then no matter what patterns you get, you have spread locations. 
You can fine tune the positioning with your group, such as having a tank even go in the open middle spot when the vents are next to each other. Just make sure you have a good grasp on how to translate this across to other safe spots. For Tetra Flare stacks, you can change it to have melees and tanks stack together with ranged and healer stacking. This increases uptime without making things much more complex. The main reason we want to do light parties is not just to make sure everyone is spread well, but so that you have a healer in both groups for healing. If you have to do opposite corners, there's little room in the safe spots, and they are very far apart. Heal up while dodging the third and final vent explosion. In the middle of it, he will cast Sunforge. If it was a conceptual Tetra Flare, you can just all dodge the Sunforge where you are. Stack tanks on melees and healers with range. If you got conceptual Octa Flare, you have a decision to make. Keep it simple and have players run back to their designated partner spots, or have specific players adjust so that casters don't need to run as far. Whichever you choose, make sure your party is on the same wavelength. After finishing the fourfold fires, he will use his second Flame Viper Tank Buster. This is five minutes into the fight. So again, first one, use everything you can. This one, you'll want to be a bit more smart since the third one is in another minute or so. He will cast Reforge Reflection for the third time. While the pattern is carried over from the first set, the second set are entirely different mechanics. Gorgons were discussed first last time, so let's do it again. Same as before, stay outside of his hitbox to avoid the intro kick. Gorgomantea is much upgraded this time. Everyone gets an eye, everyone gets a blood, and there are two more mechanics I'll talk about in a moment. Just like the first Gorgons, there is a role-based order. Look at your timers. Your shorter timer is the mechanic you need to do first. If you are Eye of the Gorgon first as a DPS, all DPS have Eye first and Blood second. All of our Blood of the Gorgons this time though, we do not use. Our arena markers are placed like so, partly for this mechanic. Your intercardinal color matches your cardinal priority for this mechanic. For colorblind players, just remember 1, 2, 3, 4, A, B, C, D and match it to your intercard marker. Four Gorgons all spawn at once, cardinal or intercardinal. Dodge the gaze, then handle four eyes and four bloods at once without leaving the middle squares. Four clones will have appeared outside and will do a line AoE, forcing everyone to stay within the small area you have. The eyes will gaze the Gorgons back, the Bloods will stand on the opposite rotation to avoid hitting other players, and avoid hitting the Gorgons. These are just damage for the purpose of solving this mechanic. So if the Gorgons spawn into Cardinal, Bloods will stand on the Cardinals. The groups will have 5 seconds to swap spots. I1 is Blood 2, and Blood 1 is I2. So everyone gets a turn in each spot. This will keep the Gorgons frozen for the entire mechanic. Otherwise, you won't have enough time to solve the final part, which is in itself three mechanics. Another clone will spawn at a random spot and do another line AoE. This will kill off two of the frozen Gorgons, leaving two alive. If you got into Cardinal Gorgons, he seems to be able to spawn the clone in any direction, killing any two he wishes, though it will never go diagonal. If you got Cardinal Gorgons, the only two AoEs make a plus shape. Run to the Gorgons that won't be killed with your light parties using your Gorgon 1 rotation, with some adjustments I'll go over in a second. The final two debuffs we have are Breath of the Gorgon and Crown of the Gorgon. Breath of the Gorgon is a stack AoE that will kill the snakes, which we do need to do. Crown of the Gorgon is a massive petrifying AoE that can only be blocked by line of sight. That is to say, you need something to block the AoE. That's what the two living Gorgons are for. Have everyone stack in front of their light party's Gorgon, while the crown of the Gorgon players hide behind them. The crown will go off and be blocked by the Gorgons, then immediately after, the stack will go off. With everyone close to the Gorgon, all four players within the light party will share the stack, including the crown player. This will finish off Gorgons too, but we skipped the main issue. Light parties 
is not enough because of situations like this. Everyone in my light party got a debuff, but you need one each light party. It's made simple by the fact that these are, once again, role-based. Both breaths will go on DPS or support, never one of each. Same for Crown. So for this situation, this is what it looks like. All four debuffs are in Party 1. Doing a DPS and tank swap automatically solves the issue of debuffs. Treat it like Mini Gorgon's 1 in that sense. DPS have two of the same buff in one light party, swap melee. Support do, swap the tanks. The main thing to watch out for is the timing of the final clone. This final clone will only act when the breaths go off, so you really need to pay attention to his spawn point and avoid both snakes in his path. When you complete the crown and breath debuffs, he will return to normal and continue the fight. So let's go over Hippocampus. Once again, arm's length and sure cast are wanted for his landing. Especially so this time, since he will turn to a random cardinal direction and cast either Quadrupedal Crush or Quadrupedal Impact. He will jump to the edge of the arena in that direction. Crush is a gigantic AoE that forces you to disengage. For reference, its radius is three squares in length. Ignoring that it is a circle, that means only the furthest row or column away from him is safe. Impact is a gigantic knockback, sending you about the same distance, three squares. So make sure you're running to his landing spot. From his new landing spot, he will cast either Conceptual Tetra Flare or a new one, Conceptual Die Flare. Tetra Flare is the same as before, designated partners. Die Flare is light party stacks. I'll go over how we resolve these after going over Blazing Footfalls. This is a four-part set of attacks that he becomes untargetable for, so you can focus on the mechanic and no need to fight. All four attacks will be telegraphed before using them back-to-back -back with only short pauses between. Sprint is recommended too. He will always begin with a forward dash that knocks back to the side. The entire center line is death, so use the black lines to stay just at the edge. Then there will be a quadrupedal crush or impact 90 degrees from his dash's end point. Be knocked back to the side in accordance to whichever attack you get. If you get crush, knock back away from it. Impact, knock back toward it. In the pause between the first dash and this jump, the tetra flare or die flare will go off. From this new landing spot, he will do a second dash into another jump 90 degrees from his new position. It will be the opposite of the first. Dash, crush, dash, impact, or dash, impact, dash, crush. During the time after the conceptual goes off, volcanic torches will spawn. This is the type where a single row or column will be safe. The same as in normal, or consider this only half of the single square safety torches. Either way, one row to the sides will be safe. Get knocked into the appropriate direction for the second jump and react to which direction the torches go. If the second jump is impact, don't jump the gun and angle yourself to the sides. Aim yourself straight to the opposite end with only a slight angle. In an ideal situation, you get punted over to the safe side and can run straight up the line toward the boss. If you're not already in the line, you have time to move into it. Then run up the line, since you need to get back to hitting him after all. As the torches go off, he will become targetable again and will transform out of Hippocampus for the final time. Let's backtrack to the Die Flare and Tetra Flare. My group is doing a static close to far positioning. Something like this with Light Party 1 close and Light Party 2 at max melee. Tetra Flare, partners can follow the same idea. Do your Chthonic Event partners, melee with tanks and so on. This again allows the melees to maximize their uptime toward the Enrage. That covers both of the second set of transformations. When you survive the first of the transformations, he will do the third and final Flame Viper. Use every personal cooldown you have and prepare for him to immediately go into the final Reforged Reflection of the fight. After this transformation, he will do one last Genesis of Flame and then Enrage. If you manage to push him past 50%, 
he will transform and move into the second part of the fight. Congrats, enjoy your checkpoint, and hope you are ready to learn even more stuff with part two. He's a striking dummy, but you have a lot to learn. Thank you for watching this guide on Abyssos the Eighth Circle Savage Part 1. Like, comment, subscribe if you can to see more guides, it helps me out. Follow my socials link below, and maybe follow my Patreon for more content like this. Take care, and may the power of Anne and the flee waste to your enemies. And an extra special thanks to all my patrons over on Patreon, with an extra special thanks going out to... Ashtree Dweller, Eamon al -Khatib, Benjamin Hahn, Benjamin Haynes, Benjamin Rice, Sadir Diosasan, Serex, Ethan Olson, Ethan W, Frazier97, James Hall, JB Haruska, Jericho, Kevin Lowe, Marlon Sebo, Mizella, Nick Griffin, T Rogue, Tim A, and Zero Two. Thanks again. Hope you're looking forward to beating this fight every time you want an attempt at the Big Bad Part 2.